Hi, everyone around the world. I am blessed to have chocolate in my lap tonight to start things, which is wonderful. And we broke through 183,000 subscribers this week. And tonight, after your popular demand, I'll be updating the extraordinary experience of Jerry Wills at the Aramumuru Mystery Door in Peru, where his wife, Kathy, saw with her own eyes Jerry glow with light and then disappear through what appeared to be the solid rock door. And what Jerry thought was another universe that surrounds this universe. I'm gonna put chocolate down and we're gonna dive into this. And I'm gonna start with what is interesting to me is a sign that public interest in extraterrestrial intelligence keeps growing. The latest August of 2021 Gallup poll shows that, quote, 41% of adults now believe some UFOs involve alien spacecraft from another planet. And that is up eight points from 33% in 2019, only two years ago, close quote. Meanwhile, more and more science news updates are like this June 8, 2021 headline in space.com. Quote, do parallel universes exist? We might live in a multiverse, close quote. Some scientists hypothesize that way back in time, a different universe might have existed before the one we're in now. And the previous universe could have been the exact mirror image of our current universe. Another question is, could our current universe be surrounded by another larger universe in parallel to this one? And what if our universe surrounds another smaller universe, sort of like Russian dolls that fit inside each other? That concept came up in a 2007 conference in Phoenix, Arizona, where I met Jerry and Kathy Wills. Jerry had been leading tourist expeditions to a strange Inca site in the Peruvian mountains of Hayumarca along the shores of Lake Titicaca. The strange site is called Aramu Muru. Those words in Peruvian language translate as city or gate of the gods. Its official discovery date in the modern world was 1996 by a mountain guide named Jose Mamani. But long before 1996, the name Aramu Muru was also allegedly the name of an Incan priest who served in the Temple of the Seven Rays nearly five centuries ago. The temple had a golden disc known as the Key of the Gods of the Seven Rays that could open this doorway carved in the sandstone. According to Incan priests, the rock doorway could transform into a tunnel lighted by a strange blue glow that led to a city of gods. Peru's Inca civilization emerged from the 12th century onward, and then nearly 600 years later, on November 16, 1532, the Inca king, Atahualpa, and the Spanish conquistador, Francisco Pizarro, met on the plaza of an Incan city. But Pizarro was not there in peace. His Spanish fighters ambushed the Inca king and killed all of his guards. Then Pizarro kept the Inca king alive to do his bidding in order to control the Inca empire. At that ambush, Legend says there was an Incan priest named Aramu Muru who escaped from the Spanish warriors and headed for the rock door near Lake Titicaca that he knew could take him to the city of the gods. You can see the rectangle carved in the sandstone at the lower right of this big red butte. Legend says that priest Aramu Muru knew the secret to passing through that red rock door and entering a tunnel to another dimension. 
The Aramumuru Rock Doorway is 43 miles southeast of Puno on Lake Titicaca, not far from the Bolivian border. Lake Titicaca straddles between Peru and Bolivia in the Andes Mountains. The big lake is one of South America's largest and the world's highest navigable body of water at 12,507 feet altitude. Its waters stretch for 118 miles and are famous for being very still and brightly reflective, perhaps because the lake still contains salt water. The speculation is that Lake Titicaca was once at or below sea level of the Pacific Ocean before the land was pushed up 12,000 feet above the ocean while still containing salty ocean water. Exactly how and when the dramatic uplift took place to create the Andes Mountains is argued by geophysicists. But according to recent studies of helium-3 created by cosmic rays and minerals at the Earth's surface, most of the Andes Mountains, including Lake Titicaca's salty ocean water, were already 12,000 feet high at least 44 million years ago. For the ancient Incans, Lake Titicaca was where the universe began, where their god Viracocha emerged, where the world was born, and where their souls return after death. Some local residents on Lake Titicaca are afraid to go to the Auramu Muru doorway because of strange UFO lights reported there and rumors of people having disappeared when close to that rock doorway. Other local Quechua and Aymara natives are also afraid of the rock doorway and won't let their children near it. The T-shaped alcove is cut into the solid red sandstone about two meters high or near six feet and only a few inches deep into the rock. Local shamans call Aramumuru a dimensional portal that has long transported Incan priests throughout the ancient Incan Empire, and perhaps to other planets in this universe, or even to a different universe. Local Peruvians, who are not afraid of the rock doorway, revere the site and say it is where life was first created on Earth, other eyewitnesses claim to have seen strange, very tall men, accompanied by glowing spheres of light, walk right out of the solid rock door onto the ground, and even then walking on to Lake Titicaca. One of those tall men who disappeared in glowing light at the Aramu Muru rock doorway is Jerry Wills. He is very tall, six feet nine inches, the date was November 11th, 1998, at 11 p.m. local time. Jerry and his wife, Kathy, were newlyweds, and Jerry was at the rock doorway because he had been trying to understand his strange life and strange places in Peru. Jerry Wills was born an orphan in 1953 and was left to die alone in a cold Kentucky farmhouse but he was rescued and adopted by a Kentucky family who had a farm. In 1965, at age 12 and a half, on a cold fall day, he was stacking wood at sundown. Suddenly, a silver blimp-shaped aerial vehicle appeared under a full moon over some tall pine trees. Large pale lights pulsed one after the other around the UFO, going in one direction and then reversing in a slow, steady pulse. There was no wind, but the tops of the pine trees whipped back and forth as if the UFO was emitting some kind of energy. In his mind, Jerry Wills heard a telepathic thought voice from whoever was in the silver craft say that the unseen visitors would return to meet Jerry again in the future. A year later, in July 1966, Jerry was face-to-face -face with a tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, extraterrestrial man named Zoe. Zoe said he was from a humanoid civilization on a planet orbiting the star Tau Ceti, about 12 light-years from Earth. There were several face-to-face -face meetings over a five-year period and a trip aboard a silver spacecraft that Jerry Wells took 
in which Zoe controlled the craft with hand-imprinted panels directed by his mind. Zoe became a teacher to Jerry. One of Zoe's teaching tools was a four-foot by four-foot black cube that holographically projected the Milky Way galaxy and other parts of the universe, showing different stars in different colors. As Zoe pointed out star systems, he telepathically told Jerry Wills, humanoids are all over this universe and beyond in other dimensions. Another teacher in Jerry's life was a Peruvian shaman named Pedro. He told Jerry about the doorway of Amuru Muru at Lake Titicaca. Pedro did not speak English, but through the Aymara language translator, Jerry learned from Pedro that the Oramamuru doorway was a two-way passage between worlds and dimensions. If you knew how to chant a specific tone over and over, the doorway would open and the chanter would disappear into other realms. Also, Pedro had seen what he called ancient ones come through that doorway. Those beings were very tall, like Jerry's six feet nine inches, and dressed in regal garments. Pedro also knew that the tall ancient ones would kneel in front of the doorway and start singing with their forehead against a small circular depression in the rock door, and then suddenly they would disappear. Listening to Pedro, Jerry wanted very much to see and find out for himself. By November of 1998, right after his marriage to Kathy, the couple traveled to Peru and to the big rock of Aramumuru doorway, where Pedro taught Jerry Wills how to make three different tones that were to be kept secret. Pedro told Jerry that if he could learn to produce the tones correctly, he would go through the rock door to where the, quote, tall ancient ones came from. Jerry described for me what happened on November 11th, 1998, as he kneeled down before the rock doorway and began to mimic the tones that Pedro had taught him. You're kneeling there in the doorway and put your forehead on it. It'll be very hard to breathe. Your eyes are closed. You're going to feel like you're falling. That third tone, you have to do this over and over until you get it just right. But suddenly, that feeling of falling, you really are falling. You're somewhere else altogether. Explain it. When I kept falling and I opened my eyes, I was just falling through this darkness and I was absolutely freaked out. There were stars and nebula, and I guess there were stars. There was pinpoints of light, some larger, some smaller, things racing past me with streamers. It was like looking at images in a Hubble telescope. It was like I was in a bubble. I could look all around. I was just floating in this bubble. There wasn't a sense of gravity. There wasn't a sense of me moving, except everything around me was moving. So I'm thinking, this is pretty wild. And then it felt as though I was moving through something. I could sense that there was an impedance there. I squeezed my eyes closed because it was just so much pressure. It was hard to breathe again. And then suddenly, I find myself on this floor, I guess it's a floor, but it was just a big white, everything was white. You couldn't tell if there was a wall to the floor, to the ceiling, nothing. There wasn't any curvature. There wasn't any distinguishing aspect. Everything was equally luminous. Stood up, tried to get my bearings, and there was nothing to see. It was just like in a big white cloud. Well, this was a point of confusion and some anxiety because... This wasn't like anything I'd ever heard of a hallucination being like. I could stomp the floor and feel it under my foot. It felt like plastic. didn't feel like concrete or metal. Very dense, thick. The closest thing I can say it was like was Lexan, perhaps. I decided to try to see if there were any acoustic properties. So I started whistling, high notes, low notes. It 
it just was dead acoustically. So then I started hollering, you know, is anybody here? Where am I? Hello? And I still wasn't walking. I wasn't moving. Figured the best thing I could do is stay where I'm at. And it was just about second time that I hollered that there was this voice and it was like it was coming over an intercom. You know, when you think back in school and they make an announcement on the intercom, it's kind of a high-pitched kind of sound. It lacks the characterization of normal human voice. It isn't a full spectrum of sound. It's just a narrow bandwidth of sound. Anyway, this person's voice came on. It was a man. And he sounded a little surprised. So I asked him, where am I? And he says, who are you? And so I said, well, I'm Jerry Wills. Where are you from? I said, well, I was at the doorway at Arumuru. He says, I don't know what that is. I said, it's on the planet Earth in the Southern Hemisphere. And he says, oh, Earth, all right. I asked him what this place was. Where am I? Is this real? Am I really experiencing this? And he laughs, oh, it's very real. I understand your confusion. He said that, I was on another world, that it was outside of my universe. So I wanted to understand how that's possible. And he says, well, there are many universes, and you have just passed from yours into ours. All right, so where is this universe? He said, it wouldn't do me any good to even try to explain it to you. I asked him how I'd gotten there. Well, apparently, these folks, whoever they are, had been very curious about the nature of the universe. In order to understand their universe, they tried to recreate, using what they knew, to recreate a model of the universe. But what had happened is that when they had recreated this, their creation had started to evolve. It had evolved up to a point to where it stopped growing. It was quite large. And that they had created another universe. And inadvertently, they weren't planning on doing this. And it had evolved. And it evolved quite rapidly. I said, well, I don't understand this because we think the universe is billions and billions of years old. He says, well... Where you are, you measure time much differently. Time is different in every universe. We've watched for the past, and he was struggling with terms that didn't make any sense to me. For him, it had been, let's say, a few decades. But within that universe that I had just come from, it was billions of years. Time was remarkably different for me than it was for him. And so then I started thinking, how long have I been here? (laughs) (laughs) Because Kathy was like 11.20, 11.30 at night at Lake Titicaca. The breeze is blowing. It's 13,000 feet elevation. It's, It's just cold as hell. And I started thinking, oh, my gosh. It could be decades past by the time I get home. I didn't have any idea how long I'd been gone. My watch was just dead. It was one of those Timex that had the gizmo on there for altitude and temperature and barometer and all that. It was new, but it just was dead. I started getting a bit frantic with him and telling him, how do I get back home? He says, well, you should be able to get back home the same way you got here. And I said, I don't think that you have a doorway here. I don't see anything. It's just all white. And he says, well, it's just all white because of the chamber that you're in. And he says, we can help you get back home. Don't be afraid. I said, all right. Then what do I need to do? Because I really need to go right now. And I explained to him, Kathy is there waiting. uh, And if I'm really gone, then she's going to be really afraid. And the other people that were with me are going to be equally worried. He says, all right, turn to your right. Now just start walking forward in a straight line. And I started walking forward. And it's like I went past a wall. As I came around, he says, all right, 
you see that in the distance, probably 100 feet from me. He says, just walk towards that. It was this large, black, gelatinous-looking thing just floating in the air. It was black, but you could see all these pinpoints of light. It was peppered with light and dark areas. And I said, what is this? And he said, that's the universe you came from. Well, this thing, it had these rods that were luminous, like neon. There was little beads of light moving through them, kind of like a fluorescent bulb, you know, overhead fluorescent that gets bad and has like little dark areas moving through it, except the dark areas were a different color. Some were yellow. I'm holding in my hand the illustration that you emailed to me, and Mm. my first reaction was, you are the figure in the foreground. Right, about 100 feet away from that thing. Did you get telepathic communication from the male voice about what the rods are doing with this gelatinous cosmic mass? Well, the rods, they were around its perimeter. didn't even look like they were connected to anything. They didn't seem to have any reason to be placed the way they were placed. It was very abstract. I said, these light rods, what's that? And he says, well, that holds it in place and maintains the balance. And we think that's the reason why it stopped evolving. So did they deliberately try to stop the evolution of this universe? I think so. And when he was telling me about this, they were really very afraid that it was going to continue growing and it would just overwhelm them and then what would happen to them. Hmm. It was quite a conundrum, the way he described it. So they're in another universe, and they created in this other universe a laboratory universe to test or learn something. And then their laboratory test universe took off somehow and created the universe that you and I and everything in our universe is? He had told me that they were trying to understand their place within their universe and that what they had discovered is that they were inside of someone else's universe, just like we were inside of theirs. It's just layers and layers, and there's very little that separates one from the other. That's what they had learned. This 13.9 billion light-year universe, from our point of view, is inside of the voice in the all-white room universe, and that universe is in another universe. It's like you're describing those Russian dolls that all fit inside of each other. That's what Kathy was saying, too. It's just like Russian dolls. I said, what kind of machine would you use to do this? He tried to explain it. The closest thing that I can explain was what we call the Large Hadron Collider, a big thing over in Europe. That Large Hadron Collider, known as the LHC, is the world's largest and most powerful atomic particle accelerator. It first started up on September 10th of 2008. The LHC consists of a 17 mile or 27 kilometer ring of superconducting magnets with a number of accelerating structures to boost the energy of the atomic particles along the way. Inside the accelerator, two high energy particle beams travel at close to the speed of light before they are made to collide. Those beams travel in opposite directions in separate beam pipes, two tubes that are kept at ultra high vacuum. And they are guided around the accelerator ring by very strong magnetic fields maintained by superconducting electromagnets. The electromagnets are built from coils of special electric cable that operate in superconducting states, efficiently conducting electricity without resistance or loss of energy. This requires chilling the magnets to minus 271.3 degrees centigrade, a temperature colder than outer space. For this reason, Much of the accelerator is connected to a distribution system of liquid helium, which cools the magnets. Physicists say that this work could transform 
our understanding of this universe that we are in and that maybe we will even discover that we are in a multiverse of many other real universes in other dimensions. In addition to the LHC Parallel Universe investigation, it has been three decades since the 1991 book, The Holographic Universe, was released by UFO abductee Michael Talbot. He said that our universe is a projection from outside of our universe like a 3D hologram. And by August of 2014, Scientific American featured on its cover this question. Is the Big Bang and all that came from it a holographic mirage? That's the word, mirage, which is an optical phenomenon that is not even solid matter. A mirage from another dimension. Three physicists in that Scientific American article discussed one of cosmology's greatest mysteries. Quote, it's the sudden, violent origin of our universe from a point of infinite density. The universe appears to us to exist in three dimensions of space and one of time, a geometry that we will refer to as the three-dimensional universe. In our scenario, this 3D universe is merely the shadow of a world with four spatial dimensions. Specifically, our entire universe came into being during a stellar implosion in this supra-universe, an implosion that created a three-dimensional shell around a four-dimensional black hole. Our universe is that shell of the black hole. Close quote. And could that stellar implosion be the spark of light that the other universe voice told Jerry Wills surprised them in their experimentation with creating a laboratory controlled universe, but that it kept growing beyond their experiment? It was four days ago on Sunday, August 29th, 2021. I called up Jerry Wills and I asked him, if he would give me his current thoughts now on our part one recorded interview from 2016. I played it for him fresh, and then he gave me some amazing insights right after that were recorded, and I'm going to share some of his comments now, just fresh, with you now. Listening to this, I was thinking about how I felt where I was trying to get out of that doorway and went up against this invisible whatever, you know, like crashing into a glass, I guess, and how surprised I was at first, and then how frantic I felt immediately afterwards, thinking, what the hell is this? My heart started beating a little faster. I do remember having the presence of mind to just run my hand up and down, back and forth over the entire surface of what was an invisible barrier to me and finding the dimple on the other side of the doorway. But Jerry, I have all of these beautiful photographs of the rock cut in the shape of a rectangular door, but it is solid rock. There is no indication that there is any kind of a cave or a room or anything beyond the impression of a door shape. You are somehow working your way through the molecular structure of the red rock to get somewhere else by using these tone frequencies. Yeah, I've been back there quite a few times. The only thing I can come up with is, first, I thought, what is this rock made of? It's red. It's rich in iron, and it's also petrified sandstone, which means that these fine grains of sand have been compressed over, I don't know, millions of years, perhaps? Such a tight lattice, so that, I guess, when you make these tones, you're setting up a vibration. Plus, you know, you've got the inherent energy of the Earth, and the Earth is electrified. There's terrific currents running through the Earth. And then you disrupt that energy 
now you're actually creating a whole different version of energy having disrupted that energy flowing through it by just making these tones. How these folks figured out how to use such a thing as this is unexplainable. The whole thing is really, really strange. You know, this is petrified sandstone set up on end. This shelf is, I'm guessing, somewhere between 50 and 80 feet thick at its thickest, tapering off to just the top. I've climbed up on top of that with people, and without exception, every time we've gone up there, batteries and cameras died. I've had so many people saying, tell me what those tones are, please, please, please. I promised this guy that I wouldn't release the tones. He made me swear an oath. But anyway, these tones, how is it that they could do this? And honestly, I don't have a clue. You know, The only thing I can come up with at all is that each one of these tones sets up a vibrational occurrence in this matrix of silica and iron. And when you go from one to the next to the next, you're not saying like, do, re, mi, you're singing it. So it's like, do, re, mi. Mm -hmm. It somehow does something. I don't know what it does. Then things start happening. I've taken people there and told them the first two tones to find out what their experience would be. And the same experience happens for everybody. You just start feeling dizzy in that keyhole. You feel dizzy. You feel disoriented. And it feels difficult to breathe. If you're standing even 30 feet away, you start feeling this wave. And I've seen this happen on several occasions where folks be standing there. I'd be demonstrating the two tones, get into the doorway. No way in the world I'm going to make the third tone. This field occurs very palpable. And you know, like when you're standing in a tidal pool and the waves kind of push you forward and pull you backwards? Right. I can stand there and watch these folks. They're starting to sway in unison moving towards me, slightly away from me, towards me, and then away from me in a very, very slow oscillation. I thought that was really quite remarkable. Who do you think taught the shaman those three notes? The story that Pedro told me was that as a child living there at Lake Titicaca, he lived near this doorway. And he'd always heard these stories when the ancient ones would come through just before sunrise. And so he was there, and he saw them come through. Well, he said he couldn't believe it. They didn't stay very long. They came out, walked around, walked down to Titicaca, took some water. Then they came back, and they knelt in front of the doorway and made these tones. And they just vanished right in front of him. So when I told Pedro that I'd been there... And I said, well, I'd like to try it. And he warned me against it. But he read the coca leaves, profoundly psychic. He agreed to give me the tones. And he just said, be very careful. I told Kathy, they're coming through at dawn. I want to be there exactly at the antithesis of dawn, which is the middle of the night. So I went there in the middle of the night and tried it. And you can imagine my surprise when it rocked my world the way that it did. How is it that I just triggered this darn thing and ended up at this other place in another universe? I thought that the voice in the white room sort of gave a clue that if they were making this universe that turns out to be ours because they were trying to solve a question about the evolution of life in their universe, then it would make sense that the scientists, the experimenters, capable of working at creating universe levels, would place something like portals in planets and in areas in the universe that they've made to monitor the life forms that they are so puzzled about. Well, and probably if there is any such thing as programming for these things, maybe it has a default setting that just takes you to that point of origin, I suppose. Right, where the whole thing began with the experiment of the universe. Yeah, there's got to be a mechanism for being able to point yourself to that to arrive there. And that's the reason why I won't do it again, because I don't know how it works. <laughs> and I don't know if I was lucky to have gotten where I went to and even more lucky to be able to get back. And if any of you have been 
to Amaramuru in Peru and had a strange experience, write me, let me know, and I'll share it with everybody. I, I know that uh, Jerry said that he's had so many people contact him about, I want to know those notes. I want to go there. I want to try it. And eventually, uh, he decided that he would make a video called, quote, How to Operate the Doorway. And I've seen it. It's lovely. And next week, in part two, I will also share some of that video with you, which I think you will find fascinating. And now, I would like to give a shout out to last week's U.S. Marine Lance Corporal John Doe to let him and all of you know that his experience with a large menacing black nest in the night in Vietnam, along with the two other Marines, has provoked dozens and dozens of letters that you all have written to me about your own encounters with palpable black, we'll say evil presences. I don't know myself, I just don't know how the Black Hulk phenomena fits into the huge eight layer chess game of UFOs, ETs, time travelers, dimension jumpers, universe builders, and spiritual avatars. But it's all there in these eight layers, I know. And probably if we knew the truth, it's 16 layered chess game. But out of all of these, they've been handwritten letters, type letters, many, many, many emails. I had no idea. It is like we have hit some kind of nerve in this world, the many, many responses. And so now I am very curious to learn how many of you might have had a dark encounter, but that the dark encounter at some point before or after in your life was protected, that you were protected by something in the light. Sort of like, what is the yin and yang factor in all of our individual lives? And then all of our mass world lives, and then going on out into the universe, there is something fundamental to this cycle, the dark and the white, the white and the dark. And we need to understand it, I think, much more than we do now. And with that, Ian, I would love to start getting comments and questions from our audience tonight. Thank you, Linda. A lot of people are saying that was a mind-bending report. Good. So I think you. it is, too. I think it's fascinating okay. to talk with Jerry Wills. Yes, people loved it. Here's the uh, super chats anyway. Thank you very much, everyone, for your generosity. Moonbird, Teresa Bass, <laughs> Kimball, Chrissy Ma. She actually uh, sent two super chats. Wow. Sergeant Cadet, Eric Ackerley, Mark Petrie, Bob Regal, Diane Schroeder, Whisper of Love, Akashi Chris, Tate, Leon Kennedy, Sean, Your Hero 17, UFO Mark, Andreas Mitchell, and Justin Davis. Wow. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so very, very, very much. And I am very eager to hear if there are anyone listening tonight who has had an experience at Eramamuru and would share that with us. And I think this is sort of the way that we can keep weaving our own experiences into helping teach each other and my uh, trying to guide through uh, journalists' uh, efforts. And uh, tonight, I'm curious if there have been any comments, Ian, from anyone saying that they were in Peru, that they did go to that rock gate, and did they, uh, has anybody had an, a strange experience? Well, I've been asking people if they've actually been to Aroma Muru, uh, the gate of the gods. Uh, several people have reported that they've been to uh, Lake Titicaca and have experienced, uh, you know, they've, uh, they've said that it's a place of uh, very high strangeness, etc. And other people have seen strange rock uh, formations under the water while well, they've been uh, white water rafting in some right. sort of area in, in that area, I believe. But uh, I, I believe, you know, if we hold out, some people might come forward and have actually been to that doorway itself. 
Well, Jerry is an extraordinary human with a voice that is so compelling uh, that I, it penetrates in a way that you know that he is describing exactly what he experienced and that it has such a long haul of over five centuries of stories similar. That's one of the reasons that I think everybody should pay attention to this. This isn't something that is just 21st century. It goes all the way back into the Incan world of the 12th century on up. And what is that about and portals? In my Antarctica documentary with Spartan 1 and Spartan 2, Spartan 1 talks about his own portal walking, that we have portals. Either they have been shown to us, we have discovered them, that uh, they, they have been built in collaboration with other intelligences, and we have used the portals to move, remember, from Gakona, Alaska to Hawaii, out to the rings of Saturn is supposed to be another portal, and that you begin to get an intersection here where a story that has evolved for nearly six centuries in Peru is colliding with the space age and military intel who know about these portals from their own military work on the earth. And the very fact that it keeps growing with more and more reinforcing firsthand testimonies, I think makes this, for, for me, one of the most important subjects to pursue. Portals, other dimensions, we, that we are linked with other solar systems, whether we're told or not. And I find this exciting, do you? Uh, yeah, this is a very stimulating um, you know, subject. And people have asked, how many stargates do you think exist on Earth and what areas of Earth would be best places to look? And I'll just link that to another one, which is, uh, are there any known portals here on Earth that you are aware of? That's what I'm talking about in my uh, Antarctica documentary. Uh, Spartan won personally as uh, a Navy SEAL who went to Antarctica and was describing his firsthand experiences in the huge architectures two to three miles deep under the ice, describes for me in my uh, our documentary Antarctica about his personally using or being assigned or going through portals. One was, de, uh, was in Gakona, Alaska, that you would step in and end up walking out of a door in Hawaii. And these were his firsthand experiences. I have talked with another person who uh, had done remote viewing with the government. And then they did some testing on something in which he said it would be in the category of time travel. And he uh, described that it is a function of being in some kind of an architecture that you move in, but that the time machine technology is like hallways and control rooms and all of that. And he had this other person. So I've talked with at least two military people about firsthand walking into structures where they end up in another place on the earth. And then it was Spartan One who said that there is another portal out in the rings of Saturn. There's supposed to be, uh, I think, one out between Uranus and Neptune and possibly inside of Ganymede. It's my understanding that Ganymede, this big, huge frozen moon, um, has a very uh, uh, active and present inside base. So the, I think the, port, the portal, point to point travel, that seems to be the way that advanced intelligences get around this universe and do it fast. Like when Jerry, you hear him and he's describing that he's moving so fast, but he's moving in some kind of, what do you want to call it, a bubble in space-time uh, that gets him from here to another universe 
that's what is described by the voice, and that is supposed to be where the universe made our universe. And so Jerry got from one universe to another universe extremely rapidly, and that's the part that those of us on Earth who have never been introduced to the time travel kind of technology that we are used to matter that has to move in a Euclidean way. Uh, point to point travel has to do with bending space time and all of the Alice in Wonderland astrophysics that we can read about, but the citizenry, we average citizens, this is something we haven't been told about officially and we aren't being given the ability to do but uh, military people definitely are. And that is another area I love hearing from as many people who can feel safe to get in touch with me. If you're in military or intel and you, you know about these portals, let me know. I think it is uh, exciting actually to keep getting firmer and firmer descriptions about the way this universe really works. So. What about another question? Well, several of the audience are referencing the sea of darkness around the universe that you previously yes. alluded to and uh, saying that this somehow fits in with this as well. What are your thoughts? You know, I have thought about that and uh, I think I will have something to contribute about exactly that question uh, when I do more on the dark hulks. That statement that was between MJ-8 and the government person that I was talking to, and this was back in 1985 in Washington, is when this occurred. And the statement that had been made to me was, there are so many universes, it ties into tonight actually, that the beginning of that discussion was there are so many universes that they made a metaphor for me and said there are as many universes as there are grains of sand on a beach. And then the next part of the discussion that was being retold to me was that, that uh, MJ-8, talking to the man who was explaining this to me, said but around that big beach, uh, like, like if you had an island of sand, and that was the reality of all of the matter worlds and universes that seem an infinite number, as many as uh, sand grains on a beach, but that they were all surrounded by a cold, dark, see. And when the man that I am face to face talking about this with, who knew MJ-8, and he was retelling this, I said to him immediately, well, what is the cold dark sea? And he said, MJ-8 said, no, you don't want to know that. And that that was the end of the discussion. And I have been provoked ever since 1985 about that discussion. What would the cold dark sea be? And why would it be dangerous? What would be the reason that if that is a reality of the structure of the cosmos, why couldn't we be told? What is it? And that is that area that I am still trying to develop what would be a program for my Earth Files YouTube channel on that question and working with people like Buddy Bolton and others. And the frustration is that they, there can be drawings and you can get the sense of that they get flashes, tiny flashes maybe of images or insight but that it is that whole area, the, like you're talking with a remote viewer and they're trying to go into and remote view something that would fall into the category of a cold dark sea and, and they're conscious as opposed to most controlled remote viewing, whatever the task is, 
the remote viewer knows nothing and will know nothing until a long time after they've done the work. But in this case, we're trying to work as a hybrid where you would have talented people who have done successful controlled remote viewing. Can they actually go and try to access something that fits in those words, a cold, dark sea around all of the universes that exist? Why is that not approachable, I guess, is the word. So I am I'm very, uh, very provoked by wanting to learn more. But I also feel that almost more important, I want to know about the positive things in the universe and all the universes. I want to know about all the positive things in the other dimensions. I want to know how the divine field of frequencies and going through 5D dimensional, 4D dimensional, 3D dimensional us, that there are these relationships, levels. Jerry and I talked about it. He said that that's a surprise to the voice where he was in that all white place was how little separation that there is in any structural way between the dimensions. If there can be all kinds, apparently, thing that you can have breakthroughs, but that the key is always frequencies. The key is always frequencies. What do you concentrate on? What is the frequency for the existence of matter in this particular universe? And that what I've told you, I wrote down, oh, two years ago, as a guess of something that came to me one night. I woke up with this, and it was, I wrote this down next to where I was. Because these are the kinds of things you should do. I've done it all my life. If you wake up and you have this thought, and have a sticky note and you just write it down. Well, the more that things have evolved in the last two years, in spite of pan uh, the pandemic and everything, what came out of that waking up was this universe. This is an organic consciousness experiment. And that implies that in that infinite sea of all of those grains of sand where every single one is a different universe. Imagine every single universe is a different test, a different operational relationship. This is a universe where organic consciousness is the experiment. And I suppose that then it implies that there would be universes that there was nothing but non. It would be inorganic. Hard to comprehend, but. And it's at this level that that voice would be relating to all of these pieces, the cold, dark sea, an infinite number of universes, every universe different for different reasons. And we're having a hard time understanding how to live on this one beautiful planet and live in collaboration with it so that our lives can be sustained. The lives of the creatures here on this planet with us can be sustained and that the life of the earth can be sustained. And we're finding out how difficult that is. Another question, Ian? Well, you preempted the uh, next questions because uh, there's a comment here from Greg says, music and math are the main languages of the universe. I so, agree. <laughs> I so. agree completely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, Another and, one here and remember, is, uh, Yeah, remember Arnold? Ian Paget, uh, who is the, the man who was beat up 
in uh, that uh, karaoke, karaoke uh, parking lot. And when he became conscious in a hospital, he couldn't see anything around him, not the people, not the walls, not the ceiling, not the bed, not anything except as fractals, colored fractals, the math of fractals. I was just referencing that before we went on air to another person I was talking to yeah. earlier tonight. Uh, someone else has said, are the tones similar to tones used in Tibetan meditation, thus traveling through dimensions, tones that Jerry used? It is a really good question, and my own intuitive sense is that the Eastern uh, religions, philosophies, arts have always stressed tones. Uh, the tonality of, for example, the Chinese and Japanese languages, uh, they're all based around understanding having to do with up and down frequencies. And that the, as Jerry, as you heard in tonight in part one, he was trying to compare that in, in the most simple way, if you went do, re, mi, and if you applied a frequency to do, to re, and to mi, it's not going to open that rock door if you talk it. It's not going to open that rock door if you clicked it like a binary code uh, or ASCII. It's not going to open that door if you whispered. It, the door, the way Jerry described it, and the way Pedro had taught him, it was only in the frequencies of the human voice singing those three notes. Now, I have to assume that all over this planet, Mars, other moons and planets in this solar system. Who knows how many portals? Who knows how many Aramumuru? That's, by the way, I wanted to say that, Ian. It's one of those words that your, your mind and your voice keep changing it. But I went uh, to one of those pronunciations, and it's Aramumuru. It's, uh, roll your R's in it. And it's this, um, it's this whole field where there are scientists who devote their lives to studying the impacts of frequencies. And we are not, as a, in the human race, learning the relationship between our brain, between um, the world around us, connecting the frequencies that we give out to what we get back communications in the insect world, in the animal world, so based on frequencies. It has to be a fundamental key. And finally, doesn't it all boil down to the very first sentence in the Christian Old Testament? In the beginning was the Word. The word is frequency. What we don't have are all the keys to how all of this works. And that to me is what makes this exciting. And even if the universe is a bell-shaped curve from friendly to neutral to hostile, it's getting into these kinds of subjects, learning about the fact that there could be a fifth dimensional universe that made this universe and that it's an experiment that has gone awry and they are concerned about what their experiment in this universe is going to do to their universe. Well, I find that exciting. It doesn't make me want to lie down and cry. It makes me want to, to learn more. Do you feel that way? Do you guys feel that way? <laughs> Linda, can... A few people are suggesting uh, when he walked through or when he found himself into this white space and heard the voice, that the voice was in English, 
uh, they say, how can the voice be in English? What are the chances of that, etc.? But I well, think it's more, Ian, uh, as I speak to other people who, who it, also talk about this, the understanding, but it's not necessarily the voices it, in English. In the abduction syndrome, all the uh, abductees, it doesn't matter what country you're on, it doesn't matter what language you speak, the, the non-human intelligences go directly to the language center in the human brain. I've been told that by a scientist. And that makes so much sense. And that one of the, going back 5,000, 10,000 years, all of the carved uh, sandstone, limestone, having to do with Anunnaki and Sumerian, when they had that rod, and you see Shamash, the alleged sun god of the Anunnaki, and it is a rod that looks about this long, and it's always holding it. Uh, the people who arranged a meeting in southern New Mexico back in the 1960s, a meeting with extraterrestrial biological entities in craft that landed, and there was a meeting, and there was an exchange of bodies and an exchange of technologies. They said this was, the rod was used in that meeting in the United States and that when the being did this with the rod, whatever was the next person was to communicate, it was in pure English in the military guy's head and that they were told this was the translator. So that's how it would work. Okay, Linda, you asked if anyone else had visited uh, this, yeah. uh, this gateway. Someone has been there on a tour. They say they have no special instances themselves, but one gentleman in the group that they were in, he meditated and he could see beings that were invisible walking around the area, but not from the door. How did he describe the beings? How tall? What color? Did they have hair? What were, were the clothing like? Shoes? No shoes? Uh, if somebody can send me uh, descriptions of what they have seen there, it would be very interesting because Jerry Wills have, has talked uh, to Pedro. Pedro came from a line of education about the beings that have been seen coming right out of that door onto the land. And they uh, have been described over the centuries as extremely tall and wearing regal garments coming from some place in regal garments. Okay, well, we'll look forward to having some more information from that viewer. Okay, going, going forward, Linda, does it ever oh. make your head spin when you think about the entities that exist in our galaxy, universe, parallel universes and other dimensions? Um, sometimes my head spins a little, I guess. Um, I just feel so strongly that Homo sapien sapien on this planet was somebody's manipulated, uh, manipulation of DNA and already evolving primates, exactly as I was shown in that government document at Kirtland in 1983. Extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA and already evolving primates to create Homo sapien. I personally am not frightened by that. I'm not astounded by that. I am not put off by it. There's a logic to me that this is a 13.8 billion light year universe. More and more information seems to be headed in the direction that we are going to find that as Roger Penrose told me in 2018, there's not a beginning and end to this universe. It is just cycles and cycles and cycles through infinity. It depends on which slice of the cycles that you would look at this universe now. And if this universe is an organic experiment that's being conducted by the voice, the talk with Jerry Wills, uh, that's in a ninth dimensional place that Jerry ended up in because he went to Ramu Muru. Um, I, am, I am provoked deeply by wanting to know 
all I could possibly ask all the questions and get all the answers about all of it. And the excitement is we have never been taught the truth. And that how strange it is to get to the 20th and 21st centuries as a species on this planet, never having been taught the truth. And now we are at that revolutionary time in every direction. And I feel, and I'd love to know if you do, but I feel, bring it on. Tell us the whole truth. If there are space wars, if there are beings that are hostile, let us know. Because the more we know, then the better off all of our civilization is. And if there are beings who know everything about us because they are the original progenitor manipulators of our DNA. And they could explain what they were trying to accomplish. And we could live on a planet that began all of its collaboration with planets, not just in the Milky Way galaxy, but going beyond, because we would begin to gain the technology that would allow us to move point to point. And that is, to me, where we're headed. And we're going through this very choppy time. And the, the big, big, big goal for me has always been we deserve, we're not alone in the universe. We deserve who is friendly, who is neutral, who is hostile. We deserve to be in a planet where the governments are truly our colleagues. That they aren't in government just for power and money. All of this seems to be churning. And I am going to continue to try to think positively about this organic experiment in this universe. That we really are extraordinary beings. And the most extraordinary part of us is the part that recycles in the fractals and the math and the frequencies through infinity. The part that is the strongest is our soul. And it recycles through infinity. And on that note, I love you guys. Thank you, and I hope that you will be enthusiastic for next week's part two with Jerry Wills. I found it to be as fascinating as this part one, and I think you will too. And we'll see you next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select a language bind them anywhere they love and the captions have, will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been <laughs>